All right, Shana, thank you so much for that lovely introduction and thank all of you for uh, taking time out of your your beautiful summer Friday to, to zoom in and, and listen to this. Um, I am a medieval art historian, so we're going to be looking at lots of great medieval stuff today. And if any of you remember from your art history classes, um, it's all about what's on the screen. So I'm just going to get rid of myself. You don't need to see me. You should be looking at the fantastic, the fantastic PowerPoint. All right. So, so if we were all in a room together and I asked you to start shouting out adjectives that come to mind when, when I say trees, what do you think of when you think of trees? You might say things like, they're beautiful, they're graceful, they're elegant, they're stable, there's an element of permanence among them. Um, and all of that, absolutely true. Um, but if we look to pop culture, um, because that is where my head goes when it doesn't do medieval, if we look to pop culture, then there is absolutely a sinister element to trees as well. So think of the, the apple throwing trees in the Wizard of Oz, or more recently, the whomping willow in the Harry Potter series, right? This willow that will indiscriminately whack at anything that comes within range, um, which is to say that in addition to being beautiful and graceful and, and, and and stable, that there, there's an element of the unknown with trees. They exude a sense of mystery that, that definitely in the Middle Ages, people responded to in these very different ways. So today's presentation, um, I'm looking at different examples of trees in medieval arts and cultures um, and, and sort of piecing together these different um, ways that they would characterize these trees. All right, so when I say medieval, what am I talking about? I'm sure all of you can say right off the top of your head when the Middle Ages were, but just in case, um, I, am a, I am a very inclusive, which is a nice way of saying greedy medievalist in that I like to start the Middle Ages essentially at the fall of the Roman Empire. There's so much great art in late antiquity. Um, so this is an example of a late antique work of art. This is a mosaic that was excavated from a villa in North Africa in Carthage. And it was excavated from the floor of a villa. That villa itself is depicted in the middle of the mosaic. So that building that you see there likely represents the house that this was um, that this floor decorated all around the villa are these scenes these bucolic and pastoral scenes of life um, that happened on the lands owned by owned by this villa owner we know his name he's actually seated down at the bottom he's lord julius dominus julius um, and we have his wife depicted down at the bottom as well and in these different scenes of hunting and traveling and shepherding and the gathering of fruits and flowers, in all of these different vignettes, we have these trees. Um, and in a manner that is very typical for ancient Roman art, there's a lot of verisimilitude with these trees, which is a very fancy way of saying that they look like they do in nature, right? They, they're identifiable as cypresses and pomegranate and olive and fruit trees. And for the Romans, for a long time, it was important that their art be naturalistic in ways that, that really closely mimic the real world. So the Middle Ages begin in roughly the fifth century. And when do they end? They end a thousand years later. The Middle Ages, <laughs> the inclusive Middle Ages is a long millennium. Uh, so at the other end of the Middle Ages, in the 15th century, I'm bringing in an example, um, well, two examples from Albrecht Dürer. He was a German artist who, as many Northern European artists at the time was very well known for his incredibly studious and meticulous representations. And in this example, two trees, we have a watercolor painted on vellum of a linden tree um, growing out of a, a bastion, right? This built up earthen, earthen plot. And on the other side, just a spruce tree, um, a study of a spruce tree. And even in just this little watercolor study of the spruce, there's an element of precision and care that Durer really takes. He really wants to make his art look as much like the real world as possible. So the Middle Ages 
begin with the end of the Roman Empire, the Middle Ages and right around the 15th century. And the artistic styles of both of those eras are styles that value this very close mimetic representation of the world, as we can see in these two different examples of trees. So, so what do trees look like in art in the, in the intervening millennium? Well, oftentimes they look like this, which is fantastic if you don't care what kind of trees they are. And clearly this artist had no interest in representing trees that could be identified with what might have been growing outside on the pathway that he walked along or she walked along. Um, these are so stylized. They are about patterns, right? The patterns of that repeated almost um, fleur-de-lis shape in the tree on the left. They are about whimsy. They are about creating this sort of fantasy world that, that alludes to trees and that that acknowledges sort of the notion of the outdoors, um, but, but it's not meant to, to represent anything that would be seen in real life. It's meant to create this sort of notion of an outdoor fantasy. So when you look at an example like this, this manuscript painting, and you can't say, okay, well, what kind of trees are they? What kinds of questions can you ask instead? And in this case, you can say, well, what's in this manuscript? So some of you looking at this might think, oh, the Carmina Burana. And maybe you're thinking Carl Orff and you have that great, all those great symphonic songs running through your head. Um, yes, you would be right. The Carmina Burana is a early 13th century manuscript that compiles together um, all different songs, songs and poems. Poems were usually sung, so, so poetry and songs <coughs> that cover all different kinds of topics. Um, troubadour songs, so love songs, crusading songs, um, songs about the beauties of nature, songs about love, songs about what you do with your leisure time. And as you can see in this open, open page here, um, in the 13th century, if you were a member of the elite nobility, you would play backgammon or you would play chess. Or as some of these songs say, you would go out drinking <laughs> and, and either um, be super happy about your life or really depressed about your life, depending which way the beer makes you go. Um, but this particular image was painted into this manuscript to accompany poems, songs like this one. So forest wood and lofty bower flourishing with leaf and flower. Where is my once lover? Has he another? He rode away to thwart me. Alas, now who will court me? Now the greenwoods newly started. Where's my former love departed? He rode away to thwart me. Alas, now who will court me? Trees and these, these bucolic and, and whimsical and fantastical landscapes were so often associated with love, with courtly love. And so these Dr. Seussian images were painted again, not to evoke a real place or a real tree, but to, to give this fantasy setting for these love poems. And where does love happen? It happens outdoors, right? It happens under trees. Um, and so it's okay. <laughs> this is a very long way of saying, it's okay that they don't look like Durer <laughs> trees. They get to do a different job instead. All right, so when we think the Middle Ages, oftentimes we might think Catholicism. And if we're thinking about trees in the Judeo-Christian tradition, of course, one of the most influential trees is coming out of the story of Genesis, the tree of, the tree of knowledge. So this is another manuscript painting. It was painted in a ninth century Bible that was created um, during the time that we call the Carolingian Empire. Um, it's another name for the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, but this is, a, this is a period in time where from the emperor down to the bishops, to the artists working in the scriptoria, these were people who were very interested in antiquity. So a lot of the styles that we're seeing in the mosaic um, were being deliberately emulated in, in Carolingian painting. Um, so this 
folio, this page, contains four different registers that depict scenes from the story of the creation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Paradise, and then the temptation in the fall, and then their expulsion from paradise. So let's just read, read the nice part about the trees first. <laughs> um, so from Genesis 2, verses 8 and 9, And the Lord God had planted a paradise of pleasure from the beginning, wherein he placed man whom he had formed. And the Lord God brought forth of the ground all manner of trees, fair to behold and pleasant to eat of, the tree of life also in the midst of paradise, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so we can see here, um, God is being represented as Christ in his incarnate form, so that you're not violating any of uh, the second commandment, <laughs> um, admonishing Adam and Eve, right? Don't, here you are, oh, he's introducing them here, and he's telling them, whatever you do, don't eat from the tree of life. And then here we see a snake wrapped up around the tree, and the snake is offering the forbidden fruit to Eve, who takes it. And, Eve is very generous, so she then shares it with Adam, and then they sin, they know their shame, then they get kicked out of the garden. Okay, now I just want to say, for years, <laughs> I've been a medievalist for years, and last year, for what I was doing work, and I went back to Genesis, and I read it very carefully, and I realized something that I hadn't realized before, um, in part because of images like this. Now, medieval people knew their Bibles in and out. They were so literally minded. They start off literally minded. Um, but what they skip over, probably deliberately, is that if you read Genesis closely and carefully, this does not actually depict what Genesis says. God created Adam. God starts to pull the rib out of Adam's side to create Eve, and he introduces them, and then he tells them both not to eat the fruit. That's not actually the order of the story. The order of the story in Genesis is that God created Adam and then he told Adam not to eat the forbidden fruit. And then he created Eve and then he introduced them and things carried on. So technically Eve was not there when God said, don't eat the fruit of the tree. I don't know why that little detail gets skipped over in the medieval Christian tradition. I talked to a friend of mine and she said, no, that detail's absolutely part of the rabbinic tradition in Judaism. So anyway, I share it with all of you because I feel like Eve got a super bum rap from these people. To show you one more example, <laughs> a beautiful, fantastic example of the super bum rap that Eve got because of a tree. Um, this is a church in Germany. It is an Ottonian church. That's the label that we give to the Holy Roman Empire in Germany as it existed in the 10th and 11th centuries. And at the time, well, at the turn of the millennium, the bishop in Hildesheim was this fantastic super pro arts bishop named Bernward. He was, he liked to think of himself as an artist. We have a manuscript that might have been painted by him, but he was also a patron of the arts. And he, um, he put great amounts of money into, into artistic projects and buildings. And one of his projects that survives until today are these bronze doors. Um, they're huge. They're about 10 feet tall and they are cast bronze that were made for the entrance to St. Michael's Church and they were made right around the year 1015. Now medieval Christians understood Christ to be the fulfillment of Judaic prophecy and so when medieval Christians would read the Bible they would read what they called the Old Testament, the Jewish Bible, with an eye towards how the Gospels <laughs> could, could be linked with it. Um, so in these doors, these doors are presenting stories from the Bible in a similar way. On one side, we have stories from Genesis, the first book of the Jewish Bible and then of the Christian Old Testament, and they are paired up on the other side with stories from the Gospels, specifically the Passion of Christ. So those events that um, lead up to his crucif crucifixion, death, and resurrection. And in the Genesis side, um, we can see the temptation and the fall. And again, these are cast bronze, and, and we have the figures themselves in this high relief, 
And then the background, the landscape of the garden itself is reduced to just a few trees in low relief. And so here we see Eve looking very coquettish, <laughs> holding out the apple to Adam. It looks a little stodgy over there. Um, and, and there's this really wonderful sort of through way that happens. So the snake wraps around the tree, holds out the apple to Eve. She holds one apple, passes it to Adam. He already has an apple, but he's reaching for another one. And in the background, we now have these in low relief, these kind of more whimsical trees setting the scene of the Garden of Paradise. And then of course, after this happens, we have the fall <laughs> and the, the narrative thrust moves the other way, right? So there's this wonderful vine in this low relief on the side um, and it's the background for God, again, represented as Christ and he's pointing, he's got the finger, right? <laughs> he's pointing the finger at Adam. Adam in turn, he's hunched over, he's covering himself, he's feel shame and he's pointing his finger at Eve. <laughs> Eve also hunched over feeling the shame pointing down at the the kind of rooster snake combination which refers to Satan here. And all of these these moments and these actions being framed by these kind of fantastic trees in the background. All right, so the tree central to Judeo the Judeo-Christian origin story of humanity. But there are other trees, other trees that are not quite as, as full of sin. As Christianity was making its way up to the northern lands of Europe and continental Europe and farther north, um, it was encountering, well, the missionaries were encountering people of all different kinds of backgrounds. Um, and when you have Christian traditions that come into contact with pagan traditions, the outcome can often be fantastic. The Ruthwell Cross is one example of how fantastic that can be. So this is a stone monument that was carved probably in the late eighth century in um, what is now Scotland. And it was broken down during the Protestant Reformation, um, but then it was put back together in the 19th century. The uppermost arm of the monument is actually a modern version of what they think might have stood at the top. So we don't know what the very top looked like, but all of this down from this down is original. And on the front and back, we have figural imagery, religious scenes. This is Christ and Mary Magdalene. We have images of Peter and Paul together, um, but on the sides of this cross. So as you can see in the center image, there are vine scrolls that are inhabited by birds and little critters. And then around those vine scrolls are runic inscriptions. Runes were a, um, a, an alphabetic form that existed, it overlapped a bit with Latin, but it, but it existed also prior to Latin. And these runic inscriptions <laughs> literally give voice to the cross. So people who know how to read runes have translated them and this is what they say. I lifted up a powerful king, the Lord of heaven I dared not tilt. Men insulted the pair of us together. <clears throat> I was drenched with blood poured from the man's side. Almighty God stripped himself. And then it, it goes on. So this runic inscription is giving voice to the cross. This first person poem, <coughs> excuse me. This first person poem is being told by the cross. The monument, the cross, is literally speaking about what it endured <coughs> while Christ was being crucified on it. That's super exciting, right? <laughs> when the art speaks to you, that's really exciting. Now, granted, this monument is made out of stone, so it takes a certain amount of imagination to think about it as being the wood of the cross, but that's a powerful, powerful monument. What's just as exciting is that this runic poem on this stone cross made in right around the year 800 <coughs> exists in one other copy. It exists in one other manuscript that was written um, right around the year 1000. And the full poem is called The Dream of the Rood. Rood is another word for cross. 
And the full poem in the manuscript written 200 years later around the year 1000 is written in Old English. And in that poem, the beginning of it, as the cross begins to speak, it, it enters into this sort of nostalgic memory or it describes it with nostalgia, its memories of being a tree growing in the forest and it remembers when the Roman soldiers came and chose it and cut it down and then hewed the boards from it that were then turned into the cross. And then it gets into this description. So it's an incredible poem from the point of view of the tree that becomes the cross. That, that willingness to, to, we could say anthropomorphize a tree, um, but that, that, impulse to see to see animation to see agency in elements of the natural world that is absolutely coming out of these pre-christian traditions in northern europe so this particular one coming from coming from northern northern britain scotland today um, there are others <laughs> other pre-christian traditions that also in this case quite literally center around a tree um, Yggdrasil. So, so if any of you like Norse mythology, um, you probably already know about Yggdrasil. So Yggdrasil is the world tree that, that binds together the cosmos. It's described as being a, an ash tree, a mighty massive cosmic ash tree that grows through the different regions of the world. So the roots are the lowest part of the tree, they're in the realm of the dead. The middle part of the tree is in Midgard and it's the realm of um, both the frost giants and men. And then the trunk moves up through the sacred mountain to the branches which exist in the highest realm of the gods, which is referred to as Asgard. And, and so it's this tree in these Norse traditions that supports and binds together all of the different parts of the universe. Okay, now the image I'm showing you is a 19th century print. The book uh, on the left is a 14th century manuscript that was written in Iceland that contains the prose and the poetic Edda along with other poems. And it's the prose Edda that describes Yggdrasil. <laughs> the manuscript is, is, as I said, this manuscript is 14th century. The text within it, the Poetic and the Prose Edda, that text was written 100 years beforehand in 1230 by an Icelandic Christian named Snorri Sturluson. Such a great name, right? Snorri Sturluson. He was, he was a fairly wealthy man. He was quite involved in sort of regional politics of the time. He was Christian. And for whatever reason, he, he wrote down all of these different um, texts. Well, he turned into texts, what we assume to be the oral traditions. Now, again, he was writing from about 1210 to 1230-ish, Snorri was. And his texts, so this manuscript and his text, these are the first written copies that we have of Norse mythology, Norse histories, Norse stories of Yggdrasil. It is the impulse of scholars to read Snorri's text and to try to push those ideas backwards onto the Viking Age. The Viking Age is, is, runs from about 750 to about 1050-ish, 1100. By 1100, most of the Vikings have converted to Christianity and they're not sort of doing their their Viking thing anymore. Um, but that is to say, we, we read Snorri, we want to understand what he's written as these long-standing oral traditions, but we don't have written traditions from Norse people prior to this. We also don't have any images of Yggdrasil, the world tree. They're, they just don't exist. Maybe they existed in the Middle Ages and they haven't survived. Maybe they didn't. We don't have them. Um, what we do have <laughs> are things like picture stones in Goatland. Um, I'd 
the picture stones are amazing. So this is probably a fifth century stone with images that that lend themselves to all kinds of wonderful cosmic and and um, animalistic readings. And then we have things like the state churches. So once the Scandinavian people had converted to Christianity, um, then they make these fabulous state churches like this one from Borgund in Norway. Um, but but it, but again, it's hard to get a sense of how prominent Yggdrasil was for these Scandinavian peoples for who existed for centuries and, and were quite varied prior to Snorri Sturluson. Um, but even still, with all that, all those caveats and the scholarly disclaimers in place, Yggdrasil, it's a tree that centers the cosmos. <clears throat> and for those of you who, who have fond memories of Bjork London or need to be tempted to go to Bjork London, there's such a strong tie between medieval Scandinavia and some of the elements up at Bjork London. So, Yay, shout out for Boynton Chapel. So in addition to the sort of Celtic insular traditions of, of talking trees, the Scandinavian traditions of Yggdrasil as the cosmic tree, there's one more um, pre-Christian-esque tradition that I want to touch on, um, which is Irminsul. So Irminsul is, is a bit, sketches. <laughs> we don't know entirely what it was. Um, it was, seems to be either a tree or a tall pole monument, perhaps made from the trunk of a tree, likely made from the trunk of a tree, that the Saxons understood to be sacred somehow. <laughs> and when I say the Saxons, I'm referring to the Germanic people who lived in continental Europe, who maintained their pagan practices up until the eighth and ninth centuries. It's Charlemagne, the Carolingian emperor in the late eighth and ninth century, <coughs> and his uh, son and grandson and nephew, who, who really tried to expand the Carolingian empire to take over Saxon lands, to convert the Saxons to Christianity. And it's in one of the Carolingian chronicles um, recording the various, um, efforts of Charlemagne to take over additional lands in Saxony that we get reference to Irminsul. And there's not really a description of it. It simply says, and Charlemagne ordered that his men go out and chop down Irminsul so that the Saxons wouldn't have their special tree place anymore. <clears throat> so again, not much in terms of what Irminsul meant to the Saxons, but that leads me to this amazing image. I have not been to Externstein in Hornbad Meinberg, Germany, but I really want to go because this is one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. On this rocky outcropping in the middle of Germany, there is a relief carving. So carved directly onto the living stone is the deposition of Christ. So let's see, maybe I can zoom in a little bit. You can see it a little better. All right, the deposition of Christ is a really typical Christian scene. It's just when Christ is taken down from the cross. <clears throat> so here's the cross, here's the body of Christ, here's Joseph of Arimathea taking down the body of Christ. We have the sun and the moon as personifications watching on. We have an angel up above with a flag standard watching over this. We have other people watching this happening. And then we have this really weird thing here bent over, <laughs> kind of like a tree maybe, or sort of a pillar rod, but definitely falling down. It is thought that this is a representation of Irminsul, of the Saxon tree pillar trunk thing that they regarded as sacred. And in this image, carved onto a stone in the middle of Germany, <coughs> What it's essentially suggesting, scholars think, is that Christianity <coughs> is toppling Irminsul, right? It's literally topping this pagan tree over. So the Christian tree beats the pagan tree. But again, there's not been a great deal of work done on this sculpture. And I only found out about it maybe four or five years ago, but it's an incredible work that, that 
that definitely deserves more thinking about <laughs> in terms of, well, in terms of everything. Okay, so exit out of that. <coughs> so trees were clearly important to pre-Christian cultures across Europe. Trees are important to Judeo-Christianity. And we've been thinking about them or I've been talking about them in terms of their symbolic and religious meanings, <clears throat> but I want to shift a little bit and talk about the reality of trees. So if any of you have traveled through Europe, um, perhaps you've encountered the, the forests in Bavaria or you've gone to Epping Forest outside of London, um, which is to say that there, that there are a lot of woodlands <laughs> all, of, all across Europe. And what Europeans did with these woodlands is, is really interesting. Um, so I wanted to bring back the floor mosaic for just a minute because in its various representations of the outdoor activities that benefit the villa owners, um, those scenes of hunting, so these scenes of people bringing back um, ducks from the hunt take place in forests. Woodlands were natural places for, for hunting, right? For deer, for boar, for different kinds of birds. And from very early on in the legal texts that were being written in Europe, the nobility started to exert control over the woodlands. By the Carolingian era, there were very, very strong laws in place that were designating specific plots of woodlands um, that were designating them as forests. Forests for the emperors, forests for the nobility. And, and these, were, these forests were partitioned off specifically for hunting so that the emperor could go hunting. And they were, it was written into the legislation that the forests would be stocked with different kinds of animals, um, that there would be gameskeepers in the forest to, to help maintain the woodlands, um, to help maintain the animals, but also to keep other people out of the forest. Um, so, so these lands would say, these forests would, would sometimes open up one day every other month where all of the peasants could go in and, and hunt as, for as much as they needed um, for one day, right? But then the rest of the days, these forests, these hunting grounds were strictly regulated for the emperor, for the king, for the nobility as the centuries went on in the Middle Ages. <clears throat> and so I wanted to bring in um, an example that showed you that that kind of that kind of work. Um, this uh, will do the full pages. So these are calendar pages from an early 11th century Anglo-Saxon manuscript. So it's made in England and the manuscript itself has uh, materials about the calendar, astronomy, the cosmos. But these calendar pages are decorated with scenes that we call the laborers of the months. So these are scenes that represent the agrarian activities associated with the, the seasons of the year, right, from month to month. And so in February, what's the labor that you do in February? You coppice. You go into the woodlands, into the forest, and you cut off the lower branches of trees so that you have a higher canopy and, and you maintain the trees. Um, in September, September is when you go hunting. And so here is this fantastic image of a boar hunt, right? So here are the boars who, where do they live? They live in the forests among the trees. And here are the hunters going after them. He has a sword and a spear and his buddy behind him has his hunting horn and, and dogs and the hunting dogs. And so this hunt is directed into the forest to go hunt for boars in September. Now, perhaps one of the most well-known images of hunts from the Middle Ages <coughs> comes from the end of the Middle Ages. And that's the, the allegorical hunt, the hunt for the unicorn that is depicted in a series of tapestries that were made right around the year 1500. They were made likely as a wedding present for a woman whose initials were, were woven into the tapestry. And these five, five, four, five, six tapestries um, go through these different stages of what has become an almost ritualized process of the hunt for the nobility in Europe. Again, it's an allegorical hunt. They're chasing a unicorn. Um, 
but you can see them working into the woods. And at this point, the style of art, like Dürer, the style um, returns or embraces this mimetic, very natural, realistic looking, okay, Ugh, too many adjectives. You can identify the types of trees that are woven into this tapestry. So here are oak leaves, here are what look like ash leaves, and, and here is the hunting party moving into the forest. Um, and for all of its quote reality, for all of its verisimilitude, um, it's a fantasy sequence, right? They're hunting a unicorn. The unicorn's horn is believed to purify the water and it becomes this fantastical menagerie of lions and leopards and pheasants and stags and bunnies. Where's the bunny? Bunnies over here <laughs> and bunnies <coughs> in, in this fantasy world that looks so very real. So the forests are teeming with life and, and they're deliberately kept that way for the sake of the hunt. Um, now, if you spend too much time in a forest, you might encounter the green man who is this, this really sort of mythical figure whose origins are murky and unknown, but, but figures of the green man. So this face that is sort of sprouting foliage and branches and leaves all around it. Faces of green men appear in all different kinds of places, secular and, and religious, both in the later Middle Ages. But that notion of the forest teeming with life, of the tree that speaks as the Ruthwell cross, I wanted to show a couple more examples of how that appears in Christian religious imagery. So this is a illumination, it's a manuscript illumination in a liturgical book that was made for a German convent um, right at the beginning of the 11th century. And in this scene of Christ being crucified, the cross is not talking. <laughs> Instead, the cross has sprouted a branch that reaches out from the side and takes a bite out of this figure, which is the personification of death. So death is being chomped by the cross. The personification of life on the other side is, is not. <laughs> and life and death correspond in the bigger picture with Ecclesia, who is a personification of the Christian church, and Synagoga, who's a personification of the Jewish church. And this moment of Christ's crucifixion on the cross in this bigger historical sense becomes the moment of the transition from Judaism to Christianity, from the Christian point of view, right? And it's the cross coming to life, um, yeah, <laughs> chomping, chomping death as a way of asserting the prominence of Christianity. It doesn't talk about being a tree in the forest, but it takes a bite out of death. And then um, another example of a, the Christian notion of, of the wood of the cross being imbued with this miraculous power, this is this big triptych. The overall triptych is a 12th century um, enamel and gilded um, metalwork triptych that was made specifically to hold these two smaller reliquaries. Both of these smaller reliquaries were created in Byzantium, so in the eastern part of the Mediterranean, probably in Constantinople. And these two small reliquaries hold slivers of wood that were believed to be um, relics from the true cross, Christ's cross. As relics of the cross, they were believed to have um, sacred miraculous powers. They could protect the people who had them, who prayed to them. And they likely, these Byzantine crosses likely made their way back to Europe in the pocket or the purse of a crusader in the 12th century, who then had this reliquary made for it. So images of, <laughs> images of the cross coming to life and taking a bite, carved sculptures of the cross speaking about its story, and now here pieces of the cross believed to be imbued with, with sacred powers that could protect the person who prayed to them. So all kinds of fantastic religious symbolism, um, accrued to trees. But I want to end the talk on a lighter note. I want to end the talk with um, sort of returning back to the theme in the Carmina Burana of love. 
So this is an image from the Manessa Codex. It's a 14th century Austrian book that compiles together hundreds of German minnesongs. The German minnesong is the equivalent of the French troubadour. For every poet included in the manuscript, there's a portrait, so to speak. This is the portrait of Walter von der Vogelweide. Um, and one of his most famous poems is called Under the Linden Tree. And if you go to Berlin, there's an uh, Unter de Linden Avenue named after this poem. And here we can see him and his beloved lounging under a tree. He's holding his hawk, his hunting hawk, and the tree behind them is, is blooming with flowers to give them this, this glorious space where they can exchange their love for one another. And I don't want to read the whole thing, but I'll just, I'll read the first verse because it's so, it's so wonderful, this 12th century author's love song. Under the linden tree, upon the heath, there I lay with him. Alas, when you go there, you'll see the flowers beneath, crushed and trodden with the grass, by the forest in the dale, tender a dee, sweetly saying the nightingale. Um, and I am out of time, but this was my last slide. So we'll, we'll end with the happy love that happens under trees in the Middle Ages. So 